All right, Brian, um, the book kicks off with a Starbucks moment. Tell us about your Starbucks uh, moment. Well, you know, when I was thinking about the far future of the cosmos, <laughs> as one is wont to do in a Starbucks. It, were you queuing at the time? Were you in line? Exactly, yeah. It was an endless uh, wait for it. And, you know, uh, it can give you a sense of dread when you understand what the far future is going to be like. Everything will dissipate into particles right. floating through the void. And, you know, I found in a strange way that I was able to come to terms with this view of eternity where it focused my attention on what I was doing right here, right now, and the capacity of what we humans are able to accomplish. So it was kind of a turning point in my thinking about the far future of the universe while drinking my Earl Grey and soy milk. Well, why particularly then, do you think? Why did it drop you know, on you then? I, I wondered at the time why it was happening there, and it kind of struck me like, am I losing my mind kind of thing? Like, what is this feeling that's overcoming? And I think I'd just been thinking about these ideas so intensely as I'd been writing the book that it was a moment when it all kind of came together. And what, what was it? Was it a moment of relief, realization, foreboding? Relief, total relief, because it's a way of thinking about the world where you're no longer striving to leave a legacy. You're no longer thinking about the future as the only thing that can give value to what you do in the world. Look, so many people from the pyramids, right? What were we doing? We were building monuments so that our lives would have some lasting impact. Why do people give, you know, huge sums of money so their name can be chiseled in stone? It will last, right? So there's this tendency to think that to last is to matter. And to give up that perspective is quite liberating. So it's liberating on behalf of the rest of us and as far as the philosophy of the book is concerned. But that, that speaks to me as you had a moment there yourself because everything's personal in the end and the beginning, yes. I suppose. Um, and so what would, be, what would be concerning you about the premise of the question in the first place for the years before the Starbucks moment would have been based on fear because you had be, your, your fear of mortality. Absolutely. So what happened within yourself that released you to the extent you could think this on behalf of the rest of us? Well, you know, I think we humans do start from a place of recognition of our own impermanence. I think that's one of the defining features of the species, right? Look around the world. Do dogs worry about dying? You know, even elephants that mourn the dead. I don't think they're walking around thinking, Oh, goodness gracious, what am I supposed to do with my life here on planet Earth? But we self-reflective conscious beings, we think about the past, we imagine the future, and when we recognize that we're not going to be here, that is a commanding realization. It holds our attention, and we have to deal with it in some way, and people deal with it in different ways. So, so mem memory makes us different, and imagination makes us different as well. Sure. There's, there's a third one which I always forget. It's memory, imagination, and uh, something else. Well, self-awareness. Self-awareness, I suppose. Um, and but imagination is the thing where we tell ourselves the stories that keep us awake at night and get all that cortisol, you know, running around in all the wrong places. And then we need to sort of calm our mind and have our mind as opposed to our mind have us. Um, but imagination is also what gives um, great power to, to the potential of theory, which yeah. is the world you live in. Completely. And I love the fact that the great theorists of the science of the past and the present and hopefully the future, you know, they imagine things that they th believe might be the case and then they theorise them and then that's when they sort of lean on science. How do people in your line of work, how do they imagine things that then sort of become true? Or are they such good scientists that they can sort of prove anything they want to no certainly not nature is very conservative in the truths that are relevant to reality and you know albert einstein was the great practitioner where he could have visualizations of how the world works he would imagine people racing through space near the speed of light and he would analyze their experience in his mind through imagery and then he'd find the mathematics to articulate the imagery that he'd come up with and the math made predictions for how the world works. See, this is where, this is where I, honestly, I really want to stay on the bus here. And I promise I, I'm not getting off the bus, but I might be at the back of the bus. Uh, because you talked about this in your TED Talks. And you talk about 10 dimensions as opposed to what we first thought were two and then three and then four. And there's still a bit of a gap of six. Uh, and then you talk about the string theory and all this kind of stuff. And the way that you, you just repeated it then. You, say, you talk about, about formula and about maths. And maths is the great predictor. Now, for people who don't see maths as the rainbows that you guys do, can you sort of, can you open some kind of 
portal to that, please? Absolutely. Math is a language, right? Like any language that we speak here in the natural world, it's a language that's particularly well suited to describing patterns. So we look out in the world and we see repeated things happening, right. right? The sun rises, it sets. It rises, it sets. The seasons come and go, yeah. right? Now, we see even more intricate patterns playing out in the microscopic world. Right. For instance, particles, the way they behave. And so we write down mathematical equations that capture those patterns in a precise way so precise that we can then use the math to make predictions for things we've not yet seen. It's so clever. Yeah, we go out and measure it, and the measurements, if the ideas are correct, are confirmed through the observations. See, that's the closest I've ever got to understanding this. Um, I know it's not a, a huge leap, but it is, believe me, it is, it is as far as I'm concerned. And so when you talk about uh, predictions and then you talk about imagination, so Einstein, how much of Einstein's projection was um, predictions based on theory or applied maths and how much was based on his artistic b brain? It, it depends when in Einstein's life you ask that question. In the early years, he was much more visual. He would think about the world in these pictures. Just by looking at it. Yeah, he basically paint the universe using the palette of physical theory and in that way come to conclusions about how time should behave. He figured out that time slows down when you're in motion. That's sort of a crazy <laughs> idea. And that largely came from imagery. Later in his life, he switched tactics. He started to use the mathematics to drive the understanding, and that's when he became a little less successful. He spent 30 years trying to find what he called the unified theory, a theory that would describe everything, the small, the big, and everything in between with like one equation. And he sought this equation even on his deathbed. He was scribbling mathematical equations. Yeah, yeah hoping in the last few hours of his life he'd complete a journey that he'd been on for decades, and he didn't. He failed. That's so interesting. So if you, if you, if you compare that with rock and roll, for example. I've never made that comparison, okay. but I'd love Here to try. Here we go. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so Paul Simon, right, Paul Simon, um, you know, he might try to write, recapture the days of Simon mm. and Garfunkel by, via theory, yeah. via looking at his past work and his past uh, musical uh, applied maths, if you like, yes. and go, well, I've done this, so surely I can just, I can do it again. But because of the youthful abandon, which is something via the universe, which is all the psychic energy and the flow and all this kind of stuff, he, you you can't you if you don't have that, you sort of don't have anything. You've lost your superpower in a way. Yes, is that what happened to Einstein? In a way, yeah. You know, he did try to recapture the achievements his of, of his early years, thinking that it all worked back then. Yeah. Let me just turn the crank again and again, and it's going to work a second time, a third time. And it didn't. Which is ironic, because what he's doing is going back in time, and one of his great theories yeah, is that right. time is an arrow pointing forwards. Right, in some sense that's absolutely true. <laughs> so, you know, But it's as if, you know, Stephen Weinberg, a great Nobel laureate, described it as, it's as if a general right in the second world war tries to use the tactics of the first world war yeah. it just doesn't work any longer you're going to be slaughtered yeah. and einstein in a sense in the final years was slaughtered he didn't make the headway that he had hoped right general hindsight never won a war literally okay simon and garfunkel mrs robinson let's go there now and let's ca carry on with brian green the author of until the end of time mind matter and our search for meaning in an evolving universe after this right brian green's here until the end of time he's a genius uh, where were you born, Brian? I was born in New York. So you're still there? I am. Okay. Did you did you ever leave the tree? I did. I went to graduate school at Oxford. I was here. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's let's talk about what next. Well, there's so much we could talk about. Uh, let's talk about um, first of all the afterglow of creativity and what that might be showering. What what magic dust that might be showering with us on a daily basis? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, the universe has its own afterglow. It was very hot in the very beginning, and as the universe expanded, the heat permeates space. It's out there right now. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it is a remnant of creation that we all have access to if you have the right equipment. So, yeah, that's the most creative force that's floating right around us. Right, let's talk about that, because that's such so not a scientist thing to say, which is why I love you. Uh, expand on what you just said. Please. Well, you know, when we try to understand how the universe began, we don't just come up with ideas and put them out there. We need to test them. How do you test ideas about something that happened 13.8 billion years ago? You need something that's left over from that creation event. And remarkably, in the 1960s, two scientists from Bell Labs stumbled upon that afterglow of the beginning of the universe by detecting this heat 
that's left over in space. And now we measure it with fantastic precision. And the patterns that we were talking about before, there are patterns of temperature variations across the night sky that agree with our mathematical predictions. So we little human beings crawling along this rock write some <laughs> equations that predict the temperature of photons that have been traveling for 13 billion years at us from various directions in the universe. We capture those photons, we compare it to the math, and it all agrees. That is remarkable. That is remarkable, and I love that. I love it's like it's like listening to poetry. Now, lots of scientists um, they separate science and religion. You don't, um, and you think you can't because uh, there's a conflation, the, an unavoidable, um, undeniable conflation of uh, the fact that we're here for a blink of an eye. Yet we have such depth to us as individuals, but also as one. And we are bound by form, but we are boundless from an anatomical point of view. And we have emotions, and we laugh, and we cry, and we live, and and we die, and we feel optimism, and and. All those other things, and you talk about that. Um, where, where, where? What's the bridge that you yeah. could provide between science and religion? Yeah, look, my view is that we humans, we rose up. We look around and we try to figure out how we got here and what we should do with our time. And to answer that, we tell ourselves stories, a whole variety of stories. We tell ourselves the reductionist story of the physicist, which talks about the ingredients and the forces. We talk about the chemist story that builds on that to get atoms and molecules. We tell the biologist story that builds on those particles and ingredients to get cells and life. But you need to keep going to have the full account. You need to talk about the neuroscientist story of consciousness the psychologist story that understands our human motivation and the religious story for some people is a vital part of that account because it doesn't describe the outer world of external objective reality. It helps some people on the inner journey, the quest to understand conscious self-awareness, who we are and how we came to be. And that therefore puts the stories in different categories. Science is really good at describing the objective external world. Religion is not good at that. It was never meant for that. But for many, that inner journey is where religion offers guidance. So if you think about it in that language, they're no longer in opposition. And you no longer use the false barometer of asking yourself, does religion actually describe things that are true in the external world? It doesn't. But it can tell you truths about your inner world of experience. Do you have faith? Are you a man of faith? No, I'm not. I do consider myself to be spiritual, so I don't follow any religious tradition, but I do think that it's vital to have an emotional connection to the universe, and that emotional connection to me seeks beauty, wonder, harmony, and to me that's part of the spiritual journey. And why would you not have a, a connection to the universe? I mean, how could you deny a connection to the universe? That's right, but there are some scientists who think that the only true knowledge is scientific knowledge and that knowledge is telling us about qualities of the outer world and i view that as part of the story not the full story what about pre-science uh, you know we, we often you know we 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 come across these stories about you know uh the chakras uh the energy flow within you know chinese medicine which yeah. goes back thousands and thousands of years ah well you know it's never been scientifically proven no, it doesn't matter you know uh, is it true that you know 99 percent of all things uh are unknowable forever therefore you know science only represents one percent okay it's only ever able to represent one percent of things anyway well i think that science does have the capacity to increase our knowledge of the external world in an unbounded way i can't put a number on what part of knowledge we currently have within our scientific theories, but it's growing and it will continue to grow. And that's the power of science, to tell us things about the objective world that we can measure, we can observe, we can test. And that's a great quality that we humans have developed to understand the world in which we exist. But it's not the full story. You need to be able to turn the lens inward as well. And that gets you to a different kind of truth. A subjective truth, a truth that works at the level of the individual. And that's a truth that's valid. It's a different kind of truth, but it's a valid truth. So when you had your Starbucks moment and you stopped worrying about dying. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I, actually, I didn't stop worrying about no, dying. Well, that's I coped. interesting. I coped no, with it. No, tell me about that then. Yeah, look, I, we, we have to come to this realization that we are impermanent. That's a fact 
of physical existence. So you. But, but we're also permanent as well. Well, in what sense do you mean that? Because we're, 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 there's always the same number of uh, oh, good, nitrogen good, good. and hydrogen. Good, uh, good, good. Exactly right. So the particles that make us up will be here after we are gone, but they will disperse. And all we are is a momentary pattern of particles configured in a human body having a party, and a human, having a party having a party that's all that it is and your your atoms are having your kind of party my atoms are having, and exactly. sometimes our particles get together and that, that all happens as well that's exactly right and so in the end of the day we are these ephemeral collections of particles governed by physical <laughs> law and that's all it is at the physicist reductionist story it's a powerful story so do you do you worry about dying then well i recognize that it's part of existence right. and I have shifted my focus away from thinking that the only value comes from things that last forever. Value comes from focusing on the here and the now and recognizing that collections of particles can do remarkable things, right? We have figured out quantum mechanics. We have written Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. We have painted the Mona Lisa. We have built the pyramids. And all we are are particles governed by physical law. That's wondrous and remarkable, and that's really where I find value. I love the fact you say that we have written Beethoven's yeah. Symphony. Because it's, 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 it's a collective. It is. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show with Sky.